one more time. You'll thank me in about three hours. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Lord, it's you that sees our hearts and knows our needs. And it's you, Lord, that can speak into our lives in a way that we need to be spoken to. And so we once again, Lord, pause to pray, sincerely asking you to give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to each of us right here, right now, this day. That as we leave this conference, Lord, our lights would really be shining bright. That we might be those conduits through which your power could flow, through which your light and life could be seen, reflected from us for the glory, Father, of your Son. So bless this session now, Lord, I pray. Bless it in the way that only you can, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. You can plop down. So we are talking about focusing on, thinking through, praying in, letting our lights shine. That the Lord can use guys like me and you. He used a crazy man who was in a cemetery. And in five minutes or so, he commissioned him, ordained him for ministry. He can do the same with you, with me. Why should we want to? Because, hey, rewards will be given to us one day. Because of the fulfillment that we find as we give out, it comes back to us in an ever greater degree. Most importantly, because of what Jesus did for you, for me, for us on Calvary's tree. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. So, 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 we say, okay, I want to shine, I want to glow. Paul did. Paul desired to be that kind of guy, going everywhere, sharing the good news, loving on people, serving, ministering, but as he went, well, he encountered some challenges, and the same thing is going to be true for me and for you. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 27. Paul desperately desired to go to Rome, to share the gospel there. He knew that if he could make an impact in Rome, it would have an effect throughout the whole empire. So for years, he's desired, he prayed, hey, send me to Rome one day. And now at last, he's on his way. He's going to Rome, not exactly in the way that he thought he might be. He's going on a ship, not a cruise ship, but on a prison ship as a prisoner of the empire. He's on his way as a prisoner, having appealed to Caesar concerning a court case that he was engaged in. Now, as a prisoner, He's crossing over the Mediterranean, and as he does so, the boat that he's on encounters a storm. It's beaten to and fro by the waves. It's popping up and down on the waves, and the ship, my goodness, it's about to break up. It's about to go down at this time, Acts chapter 27. It says in verse 41, and falling into a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground. 276 soldiers, sailors, and prisoners are on this ship, including Paul. And now, after being battered about, the ship is run aground. And at this time, it says, the forepart of the ship stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim out and escape. The soldiers said, let's kill these guys, lest they get away as the ship is breaking up and falling apart on that day. But the centurion, verse 43, willing to save Paul, he was impressed with Paul, blessed by Paul, 
Paul had been a witness to him on board the ship. And the centurion, the guy in charge of those soldiers, desiring to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And so you get, you can swim, go for it. But the rest, he said, verse 44, the rest, hey, you guys take boards, and here we see the first surfing in the Bible. Some guys swimming to shore. <laughs> some guys surfing on the boards. It says the rest, some on boards, on broken pieces of the ship. It came to pass. They all escaped safely to the land. And now, in your mind's eye, look with me and see 276 soldiers and sailors and prisoners on the beach, on the land. The place was called Melita, verse 1 of chapter 28 tells you and me, or we call it Malta today. And the barbarous people, verse 2, the locals, showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And Paul, verse 3, gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire. 276 soldiers, sailors, seamen, their teeth are chattering, their knees are knocking, their skin is goose bumping, they're drenched to the bone, they're frozen you see and as they washed to the shore some on boards and some swam if they could hey the barbarians the locals they lit these fires to warm those soldiers and prisoners and sailors but paul 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 hey brother paul what does he do he's not there by the fire like the others he's going up and down the beach gathering sticks to lay on the fire to warm up others to minister to others, to help out others. Now, if I was Paul, my goodness, I would say, you guys, I was the one that initially told you not to sail, that we would encounter trouble, and we did. And then as the storm raged on day after day, week after week, I was the one that said, don't worry, we're all going to make it safely, but the ship is going to go down, but we'll be safe, guarantee, and it's happened. There's a prophet in your midst. Take care of me. Give me some Ovaltine, a terry cloth robe. Put sticks on the fire that I might... Hey, I'm a prophet. I'm a non-profit corporation. Take care of me, you see. Come on now. But that's not Paul's mentality. Paul was always looking for an opportunity to serve, to warm up others. And he gathers these sticks. And it says, he put those sticks on the fire just to bless to serve to warm up others watch what happens the plot thickens as he did so verse 3 there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on paul's hand in the midst of those sticks paul didn't know it at the time there was a sleeping snake a poisonous viper that when he put those sticks on the fire the snake, the viper, launches out and fastens his fangs in Paul's hand. Brutal, terrible. Guys, understand. Know this. When you say today, I'm going to go home like I heard and prioritize loving my wife, raising my kids, and even more than that, spending time with the Lord. I just want to let my light shine. I want to be a blessing to others. Know this. The viper is going to strike. The serpent, that enemy of ours called Satan, that old dragon as the Bible calls him, is going to launch from the fires of hell and is going to seek to fasten his fangs in your hand, in my hand, in our hands. Satan never has a good day. He doesn't say, oh, this is great. These guys getting together at Calvary Chapel, Melbourne. I'll just kind of back off for a day or two and let them glow let them shine, <laughs> let them enjoy their wives and their kids and do well. No, Satan never has a good day. When you leave, when I leave, when we go out those doors, understand this, hey, I want to just warm up others, to enlighten others, to help out others, to brighten the day of my wife, my kids, my neighbors. Hey, Satan will strike. Paul, uh, the apostle Peter, pardon me, says, be sober, beware, because your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion, a striking snake in our story before us. And so now, 
this snake is hanging from Paul's hand. And it says, when the barbarians, verse 4, saw the venomous beast hang off his hand, they said amongst themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. Hey, this guy, as the snake is hanging from his hand, they would say, he must be one bad person. He survived the storm, but it's destined that he die. He must be a murderer, a pervert, or something. That's why that snake is hanging from his hand. That's why he's struck in this way. That's what the locals, the natives, the barbarians said that day. But then it says here in verse 5, but Paul, watch this, verse 5, look at this, but Paul shook off the beast back into the fire and he felt no harm. Ah, Coach Marucci would be proud of him. <laughs> Al Marucci, my high school football coach, what a guy. My, oh my, he was Italian, five foot two in height, five foot five in width. I mean, he was like a brick. <laughs> and I'll never forget this, we were so bad, every year we were terrible. My last year of playing, all, we had one win and seven losses going into our last game. It was on Thanksgiving. It was the Turkey Bowl, our annual homecoming against arch rival Camden High. And we were terrible. Camden was good. They were awesome that year. They were at the top of the league. We were in the cellar as we always were. But on this particular day, I couldn't believe it. We were only five points down. We were five points down. Fourth quarter, less than three minutes left to play. We were 20 yards away from scoring. If we score, Hey, we're going to win this game. It's going to make our season. It's going to make, oh, this is what we, and we couldn't believe it. Bob Fontaine, our quarterback, gets us in the huddle. He calls the play. It's music to my ears as he calls the play. It's going to be a sweep around the left end. Well, I played right guard, and for me, that's the best call you could make because that meant that as a right guard, you know, I got to actually pull and lead interference and crack down on the outside linebacker or on the, tight, uh, on the defensive end crack him, and man, set the play free. Fran Conti, our halfback, going around, scoring. We win. Hey, victory. I couldn't wait. Fontaine gets us to the line, sets us down, barks out the count, takes the snap. I pull. That's the last thing I recall. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing I remember, it's true. The next thing I remember, I was laying on the ground. My helmet was off. Coach Marucci was there breaking smelling salts in my face, <laughs> saying, shake it off, Corson, shake it off, shake it off. I, I found out later what happened. It was a sweep, but it wasn't around the left end. I misheard. It was around the right end, which means that Paul Neubauer, the left guard, heard it properly. He pulled too, even as I pulled, and we met helmet to helmet, me and my teammate. <laughs> we knocked each other out. The play was broken up. We lost the game. I'm laying on the ground. Marucci saying, shake it off. Sometimes at night, I still wake up, shake it off, course, and shake it off. Shake. <laughs> oh, my. Hey, Paul would have loved, uh, Marucci would have loved Paul, but he, he's, he's Marucci's kind of guy. Marucci, shake it off, course, and Paul did just that. He had that beast on his hand, and he shook it right back into the fire again. He just shook it off, and he felt no harm. The question is, okay, so Paul was struck by a serpent, bitten by a viper. He shook it off. Well, why did the Lord allow that to happen in the first place? Why is the Lord going to allow the snake to strike you before this day is through for some? Before your life is over, guarantee. Why is the Lord, who's all-powerful, all-loving, going to allow the snake to strike? Why does the Lord allow the snake to strike can't he protect us? Why does he allow the storms to come as Paul experienced here in the Mediterranean? Why does he allow the fire 